Welcome back. So we've introduced the method of moments, which is a way of estimating the parameters of a distribution from data. So this is a method in statistics. We've already seen, uh, for example, for the Poisson distribution, you can get an estimate of the parameter lambda using data. Um, and that lambda hat is just the sample mean x bar. And similarly, we have estimates for the normal distribution for the mean uh, and variance. And the rough, rough idea here is you take your parameters theta um, of your, your uh, probability distribution and you write those parameters in terms of the moments of that probability density function. So the first mu moment, mu1, is just the expectation value of x. The second value, the second moment, mu2, is the expectation of x squared. The third moment is the expectation of x cubed, and so on and so forth. And so at least in the simple distributions, we can often write the parameters in terms of these these moments of the probability distribution function. Then what we do is we approximate those moments from our actual measurement data. So instead of the you know, exact moment of, this, of the distribution, we don't know the parameters of the distribution, so we can't you know, compute mu1 from the PDF, but we can approximate it from data. We can approximate mu1 hat as the sample mean of a bunch of collected data, and we can substitute that in as our best guess for the parameter. This is our kind of best uh, fit for lambda. And then the idea is that Poisson, Poisson of lambda hat, is a pretty good approximation to the data. This approximates the data. Okay, this was last time. So the question this time is, can we estimate the error in our estimates of these parameter values? So we have this estimate lambda hat from data. Maybe I had 50 data samples and I'm estimating lambda hat. Can I get an estimate of that parameter, the estimate of the error in that, that estimate of the parameter uh, from kind of probability theory? And the answer is sometimes yes and sometimes no. Sometimes yes you can and sometimes it's actually quite challenging. <coughs> so I'm gonna write these down. Um, I'll just kind of approximately write down sometimes yes. And uh, sometimes yes, you can derive estimates of the error in our estimates. Sounds weird to say it. You can get an estimate for the error in these parameter estimates directly from the probability distribution and probability arguments. Okay, so uh, sometimes yes, we can derive, can derive uh, expressions that are useful, analytic expressions, analytical, analytic, analytic expressions. Um, and we've already seen lots of examples of this. For example, um, for a normal distribution, okay, so for a normal distribution for, um, let's say, you know, uh, normal mu sigma squared, let's say x is a random variable that's distributed as normal with a mean mu and a variant sigma squared. We already know, we know that um, the best guess for mu, we know that mu hat is equal to the sample mean of my data that I collected, the sample mean of my data. Okay, um, let, maybe I'll just write down where x bar is literally the average of a bunch of data samples, i equals one to n of a bunch of actual measurements of my data. This is n random samples of my system or n pieces of data that are normally distributed from a normal distribution. I average them to get x bar, the sample mean, and that's the best guess uh, or estimate of mu. Okay, we know that. But we also know from previous lectures that this random variable, x bar, the sample mean, is itself a random variable. This is a normally distributed random variable, normal. And its mean is the true mean, and its variance is the true variance, sigma squared over n, the size of my data sample. So this gives me an estimate of the error in my estimate for, for, the, for the mean mu hat. Literally, my best guess for this parameter mu is the sample mean x bar, and I know that x bar is normally distributed around the 
ideal optimal value mu. And more than that, I know the spread of this normal distribution. I know how much error there is, how, how, how much plus or minus there is in this estimate. It's based on the, the variance of my distribution and the size of my data sample. So I can make this thing a tighter estimate by collecting more data by increasing n. Okay, so this is a case where, yes, we can derive an analytic expression. We do know the answer to an estimate of the error in our parameter estimate. Some cases it's much harder. So as a second example, uh, maybe I'll do this in green. As a second example, um, estimating sigma hat squared, this guy here, sigma, I can say that my estimates, I just use the sample uh, moments. I can put little estimators here. Um, my estimate for sigma squared for the variance of my distribution, that is not normally distributed. That's a weird distribution and it's harder to derive. It's much harder to derive the analytic expression for how this is distributed. We could do it and it turns out to be it's related to the chi-squared. Um, this is related uh, to chi-squared, the chi-squared distribution, which is another probability density function. But it's harder to derive an analytic expression for this error estimate um, in the method of moments, uh, these, these moment estimates. Okay, so sometimes, yes, we can do it. Sometimes it's a lot harder. And for other cases, there might just not be any closed form expression at all. There might not be a distribution with a name for how that parameter is distributed. Okay, and so that's the second case. So the first case was, yes, sometimes we can derive these expressions from, you know, the analytic PDFs. Sometimes we can't. Okay, and in the, in the cases where we cannot write down a nice, well-defined expression for the error in our estimates, we'll do essentially what's called Monte Carlo sampling, or we'll run a bunch of simulations and bootstrap an estimate of the error. Okay, so I'm going to write down how we do that, and I'm actually going to do a whole code example in the next lecture uh, for this, this simulation-based Monte Carlo bootstrap. Okay, sometimes we resort to simulations. Uh, sometimes we resort, this is not a fun resort, we resort uh, to simulations. And these simulations are typically called Monte Carlo simulations, okay? Uh, Monte Carlo, and these are good for estimating things that are really hard to calculate analytically. If you have a fast computer, you can just generate tons of simulations and build estimates of statistics. It's a super powerful, really this is like what we do today um, is Monte Carlo. And um, the, the kind of really, really rough idea here is you take your estimates, you take your parameter estimates, we're gonna use theta, because we're gonna say this generically. So you, um, you take your estimate, estimated parameter, estimated uh, theta hat, and that gives you an estimated, an estimated um, kind of best fit PDF. Um, PDF, probability density. So we have the best fit probability density where we plug in our best fit parameters, theta hat. And we got these theta hats using the methods of moments. We, we got our theta hats using this method. And then what we do is we take this, this probability density function and we run a bunch of simulations. We pretend we generate a bunch of random data samples from this distribution, assuming theta hat is the true value. So we generate a bunch of simulation data and we compute its estimated parameters theta hat. And we repeat, repeat that process hundreds or even thousands of times generating um, you know, random data and computing an estimate, generating random data and computing an estimate. And in that way, I get a whole bunch of, I get, a distribution for the estimated theta hat parameters, at least, you know, where this is the nominal theta hat value. So I'm just going to write this down. So you run a bunch of simulations, you run many simulations, you run many sims, where essentially you generate data, a bunch of XIs from this estimated PDF, okay? And then you take these XIs, XIs, um, let's say that this is simulation, uh, let's say that this is simulation 
K. Okay, you run K of these simulations, maybe a thousand of these, a thousand simulations where for each of them you generate a hundred data points. So a thousand simulations, um, and you generate a hundred data points for each. Then what you do is you take that kth simulation, and you get a new kth estimate of theta hat. So if I run a thousand simulations, I'm going to get a thousand estimated theta hats from this kind of simulated data. Now, this is cheating. This is called bootstrapping because I'm using my estimate to generate the data. So this is clearly circular, but it's a good way of getting a rough estimate of the distribution. Now I can plot the histogram of this ensemble of theta hats. This was, you know, maybe a thousand k equals one to a thousand of these. And I might actually find a distribution uh, of this theta hat parameter. And if it's, you know, a nice Gaussian distribution here, it'll look Gaussian. If it's a weird distribution, it'll look weird. Whatever the distribution of my parameter estimates are, this bootstrapping method will at least show you the shape and kind of the rough variance and, you know, behavior of that estimated parameter. This is called um, essentially a bootstrapped estimate. This is bootstrapping. Um, and bootstrapping here in this case means that we are estimating theta hat from data. We don't have the real theta, so we're estimating theta hat from data. And then we're pretending it's the true theta and generating tons of simulated data to look at what the estimated theta hat would look like, assuming it's true. So that circular reasoning where you use the data um, to then generate more data to see how that fit behaves, that's called bootstrapping. And it's a super powerful method in statistics. We use it all the time in machine learning. We use it for the method of moments, for maximum likelihood estimators, for all kinds of things where you know we want to estimate the variance in some estimated parameter, and there's no nice analytic expression for how that varies. So we're going to have a code example of this in a minute in the next lecture. What I want to do now is do another example where we can drive an analytic expression, kind of method A, for the Poisson distribution. And that'll be the end of this lecture. Okay, good. So let's do that here. So essentially, um, let's just do an example, uh, example of method A for Poisson. Poisson lambda. So we already know lambda hat is the sample mean. And so the expected value of lambda hat, I want to look at essentially the distribution. I want to know what the distribution of this variable is. So that basically means its mean and its variance. I want to like look at properties of this thing. So I'm going to look at its expected value and its variance. The expected value of lambda hat is pretty easy. It's just one over n times the sum i equals one to n of the expected value of um, all of my x i's. I'm skipping steps here. We know that lambda hat is the sample mean. The sample mean is one over n sum over all of the x's. And if I took the expectation of that, I can pop out the constant. And the expectation of a sum is the sum of the expectations. That's how I got this. And each of these expectations of x is just, uh, is just lambda. So this is 1 over n times n copies of lambda. This is just equal to lambda. So this is an unbiased estimate. That's the first thing it tells us, is that our um, estimator, our, moment, uh, our method of moments estimator for lambda, lambda hat, is an unbiased estimation. This is an unbiased estimator. The next thing we want to do, and remember, this is what we did for this um, for the mean of the normal distribution in our previous lectures. We looked at its expectation, its variance, and then we used the central limit theorem to find its distribution. We can do the same basic ideas here. Okay, so now let's compute the very the the um, var of lambda hat, the variance. Similarly, I'm going to use the formula, and I'm going to kind of manipulate some things here. So um, it's the variance of lambda hat, which is x bar, which is 1 over n sum i equals 1 to n of x i. And so the variance of this sum, I can pop that constant out, and it becomes 1 over n squared. Uh, and these are all independent, identically distributed variables. So it's the sum of all of those variances of var x i. 
i equals 1 to n. And for a Poisson distribution, just remind yourself, the variance of that Poisson variable, random variable, is itself also lambda. So this is n copies of lambda divided by n squared. That equals lambda over n. This is the variance of my estimate. Literally, my estimate is, has a distribution. This is a random variable. Lambda hat is a random variable because it's generated from random variables. It's an estimate, and it has a variance. And if n gets bigger, that variance gets smaller, just like over here. That's what we want. We want it, this thing to have a divided by n here. And so we also know that, you know, sigma lambda hat is just the square root of this. It's, you know, root lambda over n, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, just a subtle point here. If I'm trying to estimate this sigma, this variance, I don't actually know the true value. This is just my estimate. So because we don't actually know the true value here, we could plug in lambda hat divided by n, and that's what's called this kind of, um, we, if sigma means the actual honest to goodness true variance of this thing, or standard deviation, s is our best estimate based on the data we have. This is a bootstrapped estimate, again, a bootstrap estimate of the standard deviation of lambda hat, notice that we took this value that we don't know and we replaced it with our best guess of that value, lambda hat. That's a bootstrap estimate of the standard deviation of lambda hat. Now, this, this circular logic, you got to be really careful. Sometimes you can use this and, you know, and it works. Sometimes you can get yourself into trouble using bootstrapping. So just be aware of when you are doing it and how you're doing it. Um, and for the radioactive decay example that we're going to keep coming back to, that um, americium-241 alpha particle decay, in that example, we get an S, you know, so for alpha decay example, we have an S lambda hat is equal to um, this square root. I think lambda hat was about 8.36. Our N was... 1207, there were 1207 10 second intervals in that data set, 1207. And so if you take that square root, the kind of bootstrap estimate of the standard deviation of lambda hat is 0 0.083. So that basically tells me that I, I expect about a plus or minus 1% kind of standard error in my estimate of that lambda hat parameter using this bootstrapped estimate. Kind of a useful thing to be able to calculate. It gives you some confidence in how good this parameter is. Okay, so big picture, we don't just want an estimate of these parameters, we need to know how that estimate is distributed. It itself, theta hat, theta hat is a random variable because you actually compute it using data and all of that data, those are random variables. So this is a random variable. It has a distribution, it has a mean and a standard deviation. And so it's not only important to compute theta hat, the estimate, we need to know what the properties of theta hat are. Is it an unbiased estimate? Does it have a spread? How big is its variance? How does that depend on N? All of those questions. For simple distributions, we can usually say something about how those estimates uh, are distributed, what the error of those estimates are. For more complicated distributions or for more complicated parameters like sigma squared, we might have to resort to Monte Carlo simulations to get a bootstrapped estimate. And I'm going to show you how to do this in simulation in the next lecture. Thank you.